Thanks. Welcome to this lecture about topological quantum computation. Um, I was not sure what's your background exactly, so I kind of assumed a very diverse background, but I'm still kind of interested. So who knows about topological quantum computation? Look, there's some people. Who knows maybe a little bit? And who knows nothing at all? Okay, so it's uh, really, really everything in here. So I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe those which know everything will not learn nothing, and uh, those which know nothing, I don't know. Maybe you learn something. But, but uh, I'll ask questions. So um, um, otherwise, I will just tell something which maybe is of interest to nobody. Um, so let's start with the intro. Um, so what is topological quantum computation? Does anybody know? So in, in what sense it's kind of different from, you know, taking a qubit and applying a Hardamere gate and, and C0 gate and something like that. So what's the idea to do a computation in, in, in this setting? Okay. Um, so the idea is the following. I draw a picture, maybe then you remember. So I, I, I draw a picture where here is time, and here is space. And the idea to do a computation looks the following. OK. So that's the idea. So that, that does a computation for us. Um, and um, the idea is that, you know, after this lecture, you maybe have a little bit more knowledge why this would do a computation for you. So the question is, what are the different things here? Yeah. So initially, we start out in the vacuum, which is like the initialization step, which you have in a quantum computer. And then you have this step in time where you generate two particles. It's like generating an electron-positron pair out of the vacuum. Okay, it maybe needs some energy, but you can do it. You do the same thing here. And then you move this, I don't know, electron here, and annihilate with the positron here, and the other way around. And then I claim you do a computation, which of course in the case of electrons and positrons is not the case. There's nothing you can compute with that. So you need special kinds of particles in order that this is a computation. So this middle step here, this is called braiding, which is the same thing as performing a gate. And this last step is called fusion. And something, you know, if it's always ending in the vacuum at the end, there's of course no computation which is done. So, so there has to be some pot possibility in the end that something is left in the system um, which you can measure, which kind of depends on, on your computation that you did. So that's the main idea of topological quantum computation. And we will see that actually space is very important that it's two-dimensional. You see already what goes wrong in one dimension. I mean, this kind of operation doesn't really, you know. So, so the braiding here, I don't know if you can see three-dimensional properly. So this particle goes here in front, and the other particle goes in the back. And they stay pretty far away from each other all the time. So in, in one day, you kind of cannot exchange them uh, without hitting each other. OK, so maybe those of you which know about topological quantum computation, you maybe remember now. And for the others, so this is what we're trying to figure out. Um, how this can pot possibly work. And so there are different kinds of these particles. And they have different computational power. And uh, my lecture will be concerned with easing anions, which are also called Majorana fermions, or some of them are called Majorana fermions. Not all Majorana fermions are easing anions. And actually, for easing anions, they're kind of not universal in the sense of a quantum computer. In fact, they can only do very trivial operations, which is a bit of a problem. But um, what you have to add to the easing anions 
in order to make it universal is, is a parity check. Which is, I mean, you might also do a C naught, something which kind of entangles the stuff. And then you need something <coughs> which is, um, I always forget if it's pi over four phase gate, I believe. And, uh, or pi. It's always something with rotation. One. So we'll see that. Um, so what you have to be able to do is this kind of operation, um, which uh, up to an arbitrary factor is, uh, is, uh, is this operation. So that you need to, to supply additionally. And there are some tricks here how to do it. So, so uh, maybe you also hear that other parts of this lecture. So there's magic state distillation and whatever else. So are there some questions about this general setting? And uh, maybe it's too abstract at this level. And I'm trying to make it a bit less abstract as we go along. So in order that something like this happens, you need, you need fractionalization. Something which is called fractionalization. And I'm not sure everybody agrees what they mean by fractionalization. Um, you maybe remember there's something which is called, you know, so in a system you have like a charge, like an electron charge, and something which is like a flux quantum, which is H over E. And the product of them is kind of H. Yeah. And fractionalization is that you kind of change fundamentally either the flux quantum or the charge such that the product kind of is not H anymore. And in the case which I'm telling you is actually we changing our vacuum in such a level that actually our flux quantum is not this flux quantum anymore, but the superconducting flux quantum, which has a two here but we keep the electron charge as E. And this is kind of the easiest way to get uh, fractionalization. Okay. So now we start with something completely different, it seems. And it's very interesting because in my talk there will be many times the word topological. And it means very often different things. So this is actually, um, this is topological order. And then there's something which is called like uh, topological superconductors. And topological superconductors also have topological uh, in them. Yeah? I'm slightly confused if you say you want to change the flux quantum uh, to the superconducting flux mm -hmm. quantum. You might think, but I, I will kind of show that you, I mean, typically that's what you do. Like if you have a normal superconductor, you say my elementary charges or my elementary particles are Cooper pairs. That's how you change the flux quantum to a superconducting flux quantum. But we'll actually treat excitations in a superconductor which only carry the charge E. And those excitations are kind of fractionalized. But this is the easy way of fractionalization because uh, the hard way of fractionalization is to go s to something which has where charge E over three or something like that is kind of the natural charge in the system because there you need interactions and kind of do sophisticated theory here. Yeah? So where is the step to go f change the flux quantum kind of to make the flux quantum smaller? That's something which you all or most of you know from BCF theory. So that's, uh, that's an easy way to go. Okay, are there other questions? So topological superconductors actually started as a subfield of topological insulators. And the word topology here refers to the band structure. Whereas here it referred to having some kind of particles which performs some kind of operations when you braided them around each other. 
But I mean, it will be not completely disconnected from this part. So bear with me a moment. And if you ever wondered what a topological insulator <coughs> is, then maybe this part you will learn here. Because there's a single most important model, which is the Chekhov and Rebi model. And with the Chekhov and Rebi model, if you understand that in details, you understand most of, of these subjects up here. So just to ask once more, who knows the Chekhov and Rebi model? OK, so we definitely learned something. So with the Chekhov and Rebi model, there's also a concept which is called topological quantum number. Again, the, the problem is with the word topology kind of appears everywhere and it means always something else. So um, maybe we should figure out some more words for that. And actually the Chekhov and Rebi model is, it was uh, 1976 and I can assure you in 1976 the word topology didn't appear so often in physics literature as it does nowadays. So this was kind of, you know, people started. It was a Chekhov and Rebi model. Then there was something which is called um, Su Schrieffer Hager model. And then actually the quantum Hall effect. And, and now kind of it's a field by itself to look at the topology in band structure. It's actually a very simple model. So if you're typical condensed matter physicist, you would not write it down immediately. But these were high energy physicists, for, so for them it's much more natural. So what they wrote down is a, is a Dirac equation in one dimension. So this is a kinetic part. And uh, this is a mass term. And that's more or less the check if and Rebbe model check. Maybe I should give it both names. <coughs> so this is too easy. We'll, we'll modify it a bit in a moment. So does somebody know the spectrum of this model? So of course the, um, the, the momentum is kind of Yeah, and you have a formula for it, E of k. I mean, we can diagonalize this, introduce this k as a quantum number because it's translation invariant. And then? I mean, if you diagonalize it, let me just change it a bit. I want to just to show that it's kind of a differential operator. Uh, you know, there are like two Pauli matrices appear in this Hamiltonian. Maybe now somebody knows how to diagonalize. With a single Pauli matrix, maybe you know. Or I'm just asking for the spectrum, you see? Then it's just the square root of two parts. The square root of two parts, exactly. Um, because if I ask you the following, Hamiltonian. What is the spectrum? You might all know that either the spin is aligned with the magnetic field or it's anti-aligned with the magnetic field. And you might tell me that the spectrum is actually plus minus the magnitude of the B field. Yeah? So here I kind of, you know, didn't write out the B field properly, but it's kind of the same effect. And this H bar VF, I'm not sure if we're going to keep it all the time. But uh, okay. So the H bar VF just gives you kind of a length scale or so. And uh, um, so this was a side calculation. So the spectrum exactly looks like you pointed out. 
but it, they're actually not exactly parabolas, but they are hyperbolas, but somehow. Um. Okay. But it looks like almost a quadratic spectrum here. And uh, the mass is actually the gap, or, or half of the gap, yeah? Okay? So this is a good model for a semiconductor, maybe, from a condensed matter physics point of view. But note that the sign of m doesn't matter. But uh, I put a question mark behind. Because the fact that the sign of m doesn't matter, this is what one believes for, like, I don't know. 50 years when doing band structure calculations. And uh, I will show that actually the sign of m does matter. I mean, here, at, in this spectrum, it obviously doesn't matter. OK. But now we look at the situation where I have two materials, both kind of semiconductors. Yeah, so this is k and this is e. And they're the same, also the same mass gap, just the sign of the mass is different. And then I bring them close to each other and ask myself if something funny happens when bringing these two materials close to each other. So I'm going to modify this equation. By allowing an x-dependent mass. Uh, <coughs> and uh, so you might say, yeah, you know, this is not real. You know, Schrodinger's equation is always quadratic. Um, this is the semi-classical approximation. That means you expand k squared around the, the Fermi level. And then you get linear spectrum. But of course, this is only true for kind of, you know, low energies. So then you have to kind of, you're not allowed to, to have m changing too abruptly. Because as soon as m starts changing too abruptly, um, at least if you started with a Schrodinger equation, you should have uh, cared about the second order term. So again, this is the expansion if you want to look at it like that in k of a Hamiltonian. And we'll do the expansion later in a concrete model. And then you have a term which is independent of k and one term which is linear in k. And there would be also a term which is quadratic in k. And the fact that you actually neglect the term quadratic in k compared to k is that nothing changes very abruptly. Okay? So that's why we cannot model the system by having a step function, yeah? Coming from plus m to minus m. That would be not very physical to model it like that if you bring the two materials together. So what we do, we say, here's x, here's m of x. We say it kind of goes smoothly. Okay? So we have this one type of material on this side, and I call it now m bar, whatever, just to distinguish it from, from the x-dependent m. And here we have the other type of material, where we have actually minus m bar. And we have some kind of smooth profile between the two cases. And now I ask you for the spectrum of this model. And uh, the question is if it's still so simple to solve. So this is now really the Jack Eve and Rebbe model. So are there ideas to solve this? This is quantum mechanics in 1D, single particle. Yeah? Fourier transform M. You see, you see the, I mean, it's, it's in principle a good idea, but the problem is if you Fourier transform M, you also have to Fourier transform this one, yeah? And, uh, 
And the problem is this is kind of diagonal in one basis and this diagonal in the other basis. And you will always, so, so this will become a differential operator if you Fourier transform it. Which will be not like first order, second order, or third order, but like very, very high order. So I would claim it's already written in the, in the X basis, we are kind of fine because it's at least a first order differential equation. It's no, you can Fourier transform it, but then you should plug in. Um, I mean, you, you want to Fourier transform the complete Hamiltonian, which means, in other words, that you go from X basis to K basis. Yeah. And then you should replace the X by D by DK with this function. OK, you can, you can try it. And uh, so, you know, so the problem which we have is, of course, I didn't tell you exactly the form of M. I mean, if you have a certain form of M, you might be even be able to solve it. Yeah. Um, but we want to do much more general, like if you don't know the M, can you still solve it? And actually what Chekhov and Rebi figured out, and, and this is actually uh, interesting, is there's one solution, claim. There's one solution. at e equals zero. Okay. Now the funny thing about Schrodinger's equation is that if I tell you the energy and I say it's an eigenenergy, it gets much easier to solve. Because now what you have to solve is that H check if of Rebi is the zero solution is actually zero. Yeah. And now this is still, you know, like solving a differential equation. But, you know, we're lucky it's a first order differential equation. So um, that usually is very simple to solve. And what you do in this case is kind of, you know, multiply such a way that you only have dx on one side. And then integrate. Like what else you would do. Um, so you multiply with sigma c this equation. And you multiply with i, and you have h bar vf equal 1. And then you have something written like dx psi. And now it's always a bit, I mean, sigma c sigma x gives sigma y, and then some i. And uh, one has actually to figure out um, the proper signs. And if one does it properly, um, you just have to understand that the sigma y comes out. Because you have sigma c times sigma x gives i sigma y, then multiply by i, and then something like this comes out. Okay. And now we can integrate. Okay. So, so the interesting thing is there's only one Pauli matrix appearing. So we say um, the wave function is kind of proportional to plus minus in the y basis. Yeah, This is kind of the spinor, which has a plus or minus one eigenvalue. So that, that sigma y has plus minus, minus eigenvalue. And if you have that, then of course the solution is. And now I have to, ch to choose an integration constant. And I'm starting it by starting integrating at 0. Okay. So I solve my equation. Okay. Are there questions for this procedure? So, so now I ask you a tricky question. 
I mean, we could have all, we have, could have done this also without this claim that there's a solution at equals zero. There's also a solution at equals zero. Yeah. I mean, I can write down the Schrodinger equation, plug equals zero and solve the differential equation. Here it is. So what we have to check in order to see that this is actually, you know, a state like, you know, like, like a solution of the Schrodinger equation like we always want to find when we want to find a solution of the Schrodinger equation. You don't just go there and say it equals zero. So what is the essential property of a solution in order that you kind of call it a solution of the Schrodinger equation? You look a bit confused. Okay. Boundary conditions, yeah? And so, because if you have just a differential equation, you can put any energy in there. What quantizes your energy? Are the boundary conditions. So you have to ask yourself on kind of what function space we try to solve this. And we're solving it on the real line. And typically what you want to have is that the wave function is normalized, yeah? Okay? So you only call it a solution if the wave function is normalized. Otherwise, uh, it's a solution to the Schrodinger equation, but uh, uh, it's not a state in the sense that, you know, as we talk about in quantum mechanics. Okay? So can somebody see that this is actually a normalized solution? Or which of the two? I mean, now we have two solutions. The claim was that there is one solution. Yeah. <coughs> yes. That's a good statement. But uh, could you now choose for x going to? So, so here you want to have the negative solution. Uh, the, I think the positive because we had the mass negative here. Yeah. Okay, so statement for x going to plus infinity, we want to have the solution with the minus sign here. Why? Because then the solution is exp exponentially decaying. And typically, this is a function which you can normalize. No? If an integral is kind of exponentially decaying, you can square it and integrate, and you're happy. Yeah? Did you say the sign of m was arbitrary, or at least no, no. if m was small, so? Okay. The claim is that for this case, there's one solution. You see? Ah, okay. So we're considering now this situation, where we have... So first of all, the claim, the sign of m doesn't matter, question mark. Okay? Now, now the idea is we put one material with positive sign, together with the material with a negative sign. It takes some kind of smooth profile in between. And uh, the claim is that actually then there's a solution at equals zero. So we're looking at this specific situation. And as your colleague pointed out, at x going to plus infinity, you should have the minus sign here. Uh, the plus sign, sorry. Sorry. We're all confused. The plus sign, yeah? Because the mass is actually negative. And at x going to minus infinity, so if you integrate the other way around, you get another minus sign. Yeah? Understand? So you integrate from 0 to something here, which just gets a negative sign because you integrate the wrong way. So then you actually also need the plus sign. So the solution is the one with the plus sign. And it's normalizable, and it's a bound state, and it's kind of localized close to here. And its energy is zero. Okay? And the only fact, the single property we needed about the m is that the m changes the sign from plus to minus. 
Okay? If M, M changes sign. You see, if it's bounded, and that's what actually the statement is, um, if x going to plus infinity, ever write it on this side, it will actually go like e to the minus m bar times x. Yeah, but I mean, like if, if your m bar, you can say how it looks like. M bar is some value bigger than zero. You see in the plot? Okay. Not zero, yeah? That would be bad. But any value larger than zero. Yeah, in order to make this estimate, but it doesn't matter. If it goes to zero on the infinity, then you cannot normalize it. Yeah, if it goes to zero to infinity, you cannot normalize. So you kind of you look at the limits of m going to infinity and see if it's a finite value or not. Okay. That's enough. But I mean, in order to show it, it's kind of you know it's technical. So yes, we're looking that it kind of goes to a constant, whatever. But you, I mean, I hopefully convinced you. Because it's actually exponentially decaying, you don't need a lot in order that, that you can actually normalize it in that case. Okay? There's one bound state. One bound solution. Because you may be also heard in quantum mechanics, there's kind of a distinction between bound solutions and these quasi-solutions, which are these plane waves running around. Um, additionally, you have kind of states up here. But these are not bound state solutions, but these are like extended waves. And down here you also have states. I guess it's a statement that there's only one bound solution. Uh, I mean, that takes some more work. That takes some more work, yeah. At, at, at zero energy, there's one. I think this we showed here, yeah? There's no second one. Um, but the statement that there's kind of no other one in here, that's also not so important for our. Okay, but the important thing is that it just, if you take a material and another material and they look like they have the same gap, and you ask yourself, how can I figure out if they have the same sign of the gap? Then you bring them together, and if there's no state at zero energy in between, they have the same sign of the gap. And if there's a state at zero energy in between, then they have the opposite sign of the gap. So there's a way to figure out the sign of the gap. Okay? <coughs> and this works in higher dimensions. And then it's called 3D topological insulin. But it kind of essentially always reduces to this model. Because this direction is always the direction across the interface. Yeah? And the other direction you take like translation and invariant. And then it kind of reduces to this model. Okay. Good. Everybody settled? I can maybe also write down the main conclusion once more, but it's actually up there. But I, I write it in a different term, yeah? The sine of M is what one calls a topological quantum number. It has two states, plus minus one. And then if two materials are brought together, with opposite signs, are brought together. State at E equals zero. Okay. 
Can you actually read it? It's uh, still okay? Okay, so you, 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 know, you might argue, yeah, yeah, this is not the real model of the world. You never find a system which this is the correct model. You know, if you take gallium arsenide, then you have to actually expand in K, and they're quadratic terms. So what this has to do with the real world? And now comes this idea into the game that I told you there's one state at zero energy, and the rest is separated by a gap. So if I treat this model, and the rest of the terms is small in some perturbative sense, then I can do perturbation theory on the rest of the terms. And the statement that you have like two bands and one state in the middle will remain intact. The state might not be at zero energy anymore in general. But as long as the perturbations are kind of small compared to the gap, there will be one state inside the gap because where should this state go? Okay. So the protection of this state comes from the gap and then it actually matters how large this gap is, you know, at infinity. So if you have materials which kind of have a small gap, the protection kind of is small. Is this um, state in the middle? Uh, it's very localized in X. Yeah, so for example, if you have like the other two dimensions, I mean, now it is a one dimensional. This is like a bound state. Yeah. But if you have, the, uh, let's say, a, a second dimension, which is translation invariant, this becomes an edge state. And that's called quantum spin hall effect, or even quantum hall effect. Okay. And, and one point which I cannot go into details, and that's why I say understanding this, you understand most, actually, if you look at the charge with an, which an electron has when it's trapped here, it's actually fractionalized. So that's actually why Jack and Raby are so, they're so happy about it. So it's kind of, but, but it's a bit weird to how to define charge and so on. And I have to refer you to the literature if you're interested about that. But there's already fractionalization in this simple model. And there are good review articles explaining everything in details. <coughs> but as you might Notice this is nothing about topological quantum computation, so we should do something else, yeah. But yeah, so I wanted you to understand the, the Chekhov and Rebbe model because I think it uh, should be more widely known than it actually is. Okay. So what you get here is like there's a topological charge, which is the sign of this mass term. And you get a zero state if you bring two materials with different mass terms together. Okay. So now we take a look at the Kitaev model, which I guess more of you know. But as you don't know the Chekhov and Rebbe model, I maybe give a fresh look at the Kitaev model. Because I guess most of you like to write down this model on a lattice, uh, so on. Um, I will write down a model which is equivalent. I just Fourier transformed the model. And, uh, and if you Fourier transform the Kitaev model, and trust me on that, um, you get the following model. You actually don't get exactly this model, but uh, I will explain what kind of assumption goes in this model. Let me get the signs the same way as I had in my notes, otherwise we run into troubles. So this I have to still make your mission. Okay. So if you really Fourier transform Kitaev's model, you get a cosine here and a sine here. And with the ideas which I had before that we want actually everything smoothly depending um, so all parameters smoothly depending, I actually already expanded it in small k. Okay. So the cosine expanded gives a k square and the sine expanded gives a k. And, uh, and this is enough to determine the topology of the model. Okay. 
So this is a Fourier transform Kitaev model. And physically, this is the model of a band of electrons with chemical potential mu. And this is superconducting P-wave pairing. It's called P-wave because, no, it's called P-wave because of something else. But the P-wave you see because it's actually proportional to K. And these are spinless fermions. And the Cs are creation operators. Um, and they have this usual commutation relation. Anti-commutation relation. With all of the, the rest kind of vanishing. OK. Questions about this model? Yeah, could you give uh, physical implementation of the Kitaev model? Sorry, a physical implementation of the Kitaev model. Um, so this is just a semiconductor, yeah? It's just three electrons. And this is pairing, Cooper pairing, in the sense of, so the delta is kind of a condensate, and the condensate can inject particles in pairs. So you can create pair of particles. But the condensate doesn't have momentum, so it has to create these particles, one with k and the other with minus k. And the other term is just the Hermitian conjugate of that. And the superconducting pairing, either you get intrinsically by some interaction effect in your nanowire, or you can extrinsically induce it by putting a superconductor close to it. Okay. But the concrete details are very involved and tricky. Yeah. Can you explain a bit more why there's a state? Here? If you take the key de k dependence away, it's actually zero, the term. Yeah. Um, so uh, a good way to see it is this is actually anti-symmetric in exchanging k to minus k. OK, you sum here over positive and negative k. This is actually anti-symmetric in exchanging k and minus k because of the anti-commutation relation. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of contract it with an anti-symmetric tensor. So the first term which can appear is, is proportional to k if you do an expansion in k. Okay. And this is called p-wave. So without the k, it would be s-wave pairing. OK. I mean. Just give it, you know, I tell you, you know, check if and Rabi model, okay. Kitaev model, maybe we know a bit more how to realize it, but in principle it's just a toy model, okay? We write down this model and see what comes out. And then we want to realize a model which is close to that with corrections which kind of don't change the features which we found too drastically. That's the, that's the idea, okay? So, but this looks nothing like this model, okay? Just nothing. Because here we have like creation and annihilation operators and here it's like Pauli matrices. <coughs> so the question is how we can kind of bring these two ideas together. And it goes along with how do you actually find the spectrum of such a model. And that's actually a trick which goes back to Bogolyubov and he actually introduced the concept that you actually double the degrees of freedom. <coughs> and uh, you write down a spinner where you combine an annihilation operator with a creation operator together, like this. And then you want to write down the Kitaev model as a bilinear form with a new Hamiltonian in between, which is called Bogolyubov because of Bogolyubov and Duchenne um, Hamiltonian. And you can do that because, um, for example, this term appears in the off-diagonal. You see, you have the C here, and in the dagger, 
because you put the dagger, you have a C of minus K. So you will have this term. Um, let's write it down. So the delta times K in this term, you will have here. And the other term you will have here, this term. And let me uh, take all the constants correctly, because otherwise you might get confused. So you put a half here, you put a half here. And another trick is that actually you shouldn't write this. You could write up here, or you could write it down here, turn the other way around. Because if you anti-commute this, you get a minus sign. But the trick is to write it half-half. Because the thing is, you double the degrees of freedom. And because you double the degrees of freedom, at some point, you should actually half the degrees of freedom again. And in order to do that, and again, the time is too short to go in all the details, you actually introduce a new symmetry. And the new symmetry is kind of whatever you do up here, you do down here the same way. And that, in the end, uh, allows you to keep everything consistent. But I mean, for the moment, this is just a trick. And uh, if you write it down, then you see it's actually k squared over 2m minus mu times tau c, where tau is now Pauli matrix acting in this Bogolubov basis, which is also called particle hole basis, and delta k tau x. So that's the kind of first quantized version of the Kitaev model. Yeah? If you go from the, you know, so the, how you go from second quantized to first quantized is you, you kind of write the creation and annihilation operators around your first quantized Hamiltonian. That's for non-interacting particles, how you go from first quantized to second quantized. So the Boglub, this Boglub of the Schoen Hamilton is the first quantized version of the Kitaev model. And now for small k, we can actually forget about k squared. And we have minus mu tau c plus delta k tau x. So maybe you see a relation to the Chekhov and Rabi model. And if you see, could you tell me what the topological quantum number now is? So what is the equivalent of the sine of m in Kitaev's model? Hmm? Again? Sine of delta. That's what you think. But look very carefully. This is the only term which depends on k. And yes, I agree with you, it comes from the pairing, and it was not the kinetic operator. But this is what actually plays the part of this term. You understand? OK, you might com be confused that actually this is tau c and tau x. OK, I was stupid to introduce the wrong basis. But I mean, I guess you can all come up with a unitary transformation which changes c to x and the other way around. So that's, that's fine. Yeah, so you can kind of write your x in here c. <coughs> and yes, this is not a kinetic term, it's a pairing term, but it's the term which is proportional to k. So that's kind of the first term in the Chekhov and Rabi model. And the one which actually determines the topological charge is the mu. And now you know something. If you bring a material with mu positive together with a material with mu negative, there will be one state at zero energy in between. OK? Why? Because of Chekhov and Rebbe. We solved it before. OK? So the band structure here looks like this. It's this quadratic spectrum, and mu is here. 
So mu positive means, yeah, you filled your band, semiconducting band, and you have actually a P-wave superconductor. P-wave nanowire, yeah? Mu positive. Mu negative is actually you empty the band, and a band without particles inside you also call insulator. So you kind of end this, and you have a usual insulator nearby, which experimentalists which implement this really do like that. You know, they end the nanowire. And now it's just a check if and Ravi model, yeah? So there will be one state, and maybe for once, choose a different color. At e equals zero. Okay, there was no calculation needed. So learn your check if and ready model because then you don't need to solve like complicated eigenvalue problems anymore. How did you call tau again? It was tau in what basis? In this particle hole basis. This is called particle. Hole. Basis. And what is the rate thing you draw? It is a State plot or what? Again? What is the rate thing you draw that's easier? This, this red? Yeah. It's just a state at zero energy, a bound state at zero energy. So now what about the additional terms which you didn't take into account, like the square and whatever? It turns out that here, due to the fact that because we artificially doubled this degree of freedom. So whatever we write here, we will write here. Even taking these states, these additional terms in perturbation theory into account, this will actually stay at zero energy. This is something special about this model because it's a superconducting model. <clears throat> so this state at zero energy is also called Majorana fermion. And one important fact about the Jackie and Rebi model, which I didn't point out, is that the state which you get is an equal superposition of the two spinors which you had initially. Yeah? So the plus state in the y basis is an equal superposition of, I don't know, spin up plus i spin down or so. So it's equal probability to be in spin up and spin down. So in our case, it's an equal probability to be a particle and a hole. So if you do all the calculation and you kind of see how this, connect, how, how this calculation connects to the second quantized calculation, you actually see that there's an operator and it can be written <coughs> whereby this red here is the wave function. which is kind of localized close to zero. And then we have to kind of, you know, connect our second quantized initial formulation to the first quantized fo formulation which we did. And I just told you there's an equal superposition of, uh, of electron and hole part. That will come out. Whether now it's exactly plus and so on, not so important. But what will come out is that actually gamma is a remission operator. It's a remission, but fermionic. Yeah, because there's only one psi here. And the normalization is that gamma squared, this comes together with that we can actually normalize this bound state wave function. This is a normalization. I 
And yes, I didn't tell you all the details because we could make like three lectures explaining all the details and one could have a whole school about topological quantum computation. But at least maybe you, you should have understood kind of what are the steps to actually get there where we ended. So for the rest, what we actually need is that at each interface, Um, there's a, there's a Majorana fermion. Gamma K at each interface K. So if you would have a P wave and then again a P wave. There would be another Majorana fermion here. at least approximately, because the wave functions actually decay exponentially. So they don't talk to each other so much. And then you would have another insulator, you would have another Majorana fermion, and so on and so forth. Yeah? There's a question there. No. And then both these properties, that they're fermionic and this normalization, combined in the, in, the, in the algebra of the Majorana, which is the following. So it's an anti-commutator because it's actually fermionic. So different Majorana fermions anti-commute and the same Majorana fermion squared to one. So that's combined here. Plus the fact that actually all of them are Hermitian. And that's all what you have to know for the rest of the lecture. Okay? So let us recapitulate. We found that the Check If and Rebbe model, that for certain types of models, there's something which we call topological charge, topological quantum number, which meant that if you bring two materials together which have a different sign of the mass, which is a topological charge, there's always an interface state between them. And this is all what you have to know about topological insulators, topological superconductors. It all comes down to this point. Then we've seen that actually the Kitaev model is nothing else than the jackif rebbe model made a bit more fancy, such that we had to introduce a trick, like this Bogolubov trick, in order to extract the first quantized part of it. Yeah. This is a combination of the second quantized Hamiltonian to some kind of first quantized Hamiltonian. We wrote on the first quantized Hamiltonian, so ah, it's essentially a Jekyll and Rebbe model. But now the sign of the chemical potential tells us like which, if you have a positive or negative mass gap. And the sign of the chemical potential physically means that we have a P wave superconductor if the sign is positive. If the sign is negative, we actually have no electrons in the system. So it's just a normal insulator. And at each interface, we got a bound state. And the bound state had the property that's actually Hermitian we can normalize it, but it's still a fermionic mode, such that it actually anti-commutes with another fermionic mode. Now coming back to your question about the fractionization, we have here actually a superconductor. So the superconductor actually has a flux quantum, which is half of the usual flux quantum, but this mode is still like a usual fermion, meaning an unpaired Cooper pair, so a single unpaired electron. So it's a fractional excitation. The fact that it's a fractionalization is actually not so surprising because actually the Jackie Rebbe model actually already has fractionalization inside, which I didn't have time to, to explain in details. Yeah? Uh, where have you seen mass that um, one Majorana fermion can't exist by itself? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah, so the question is what is the fractionization? And that's a big question if you look at all the literature. You always have to define it with respect to a background. So now it turns out we have kind of two vacuum in the world, yeah? The P wave vacuum and the insulator vacuum. But the background according to which you actually count the charges is just the insulator vacuum, okay? So you, you have to imagine you have an insulator in the world and then you start introducing a P wave superconductor and then you start counting the charge in the process, yeah? Kind of imagine you do it adiabatically and kind of start charges which are cr created in this process. And then you always have to, you know, so if, if, I, if I require that in the end of the universe there's always an insulator, <coughs> then the Marana fermions always come in pairs. Okay? So, in, so in, in an experimental situation, you, you none of has always to end somewhere. Uh, not at all. So what happens if there's one? What happens if there are, so, so you're thinking about, uh, about the case, how do I get this P-wave pairing? You know, I'm a theoretician. I say if you have the right types of interaction in your nanomire, then it will pair P-wave, but it will not, as we all know. So the, typically you, you put the superconductor on top here. Yeah? So the Schottky pair will actually reduce this delta parameter. And if the delta parameter will be reduced and you do the calculation, means this wave function will become more extended. No, I mean, at zero temperature, it will still work. You just have to put like the particles further apart from each other. So, so and a crucial fact for what I will be going in the next is that they are, these are actually all zero modes and that means that they are kind of further apart from each other than this exponential decay. Because then we say, yeah, here we apply Jackie von Rebi and here we apply Jackie von Rebi and they're essentially not talking to each other, the two domain walls. Yeah, so we do the same trick with finding the solution like here. Why did you say it's uh, usual in the later? It should obey the same Hamiltonian? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, Go to mu going to minus infinity. Okay, then I say this term is completely unimportant. This term is actually also unimportant. But there's just no particle in the system. Yeah. This one? Yeah. So if you really have like a real, real S wave superconductor, this part doesn't exist. But typically, because you have spin orbit, the notion of S and P wave is not so well defined. And as I pointed out, if you have spinless electrons, there's no way to even in introduce S wave pairing because this term actually vanishes identically. So the only thing that if you, if you try to introduce superconductivity, you might not manage at all, but if you manage, then you will have automatically P wave pairing. Okay. Good. Are there any other questions? Otherwise, I will explain to you how to make a qubit out of that. I mean, you know. Now we are back to kind of pure algebra. We kind of have operators and kind of anti-commutation relation between them. And we might construct some Hilbert space, and then we kind of do some operations on that. <coughs> okay. So this was now the physical part, or I don't know. <coughs> Maybe run a qubit. How to make a qubit out of them? First question, because in a sense we are in a second quantized setting, yeah? So our particles, which are the gamma operators, have some kind of weird anti commutation relation, which is like what you know if you treat bosons and fermions, yeah? So first question, what is the Fock space?
So if you have like five of these operators, or five is not a good number, six of these operators, um, in what space I can actually describe uh, the action? Okay, we start with a vacuum, and then we start applying whatever. I mean, first question, what is a vacuum? And then, yeah. and, and the solution is actually rather trivial. Maybe some of you know. Um, what you can do, you can pair up my runner fermions. Again, essentially, we're treating a system of non-interacting particles. The fact that it fractionalizes was this Chekhov and Rebbe thing that Chekhov and Rebbe kind of manages to kind of break an excitation here into two excitations at the boundary. So what we do here is just we put them back together artificially and we back at real electrons. Pair up my Arana fermions, how you do is unimportant. And something which is unimportant is also called, it's a gauge. So how you pair them up, it's kind of called a gauge. Um, so we kind of pair up the two nearby. That kind of makes the most sense. But for example, you take gamma 1, and you call it C. Maybe I should call it something else, because I had C before. But that's some new C. And uh, we have to put one half in here. And of course, this should be the adjoint. So the adjoint is like. Okay, what I'm telling you is nothing else than gamma 1 is the real part and gamma 2 is the imaginary part of our complex C. Okay. So if you do this, what you actually figure out is that uh, C, C dagger is 1 and C, C is 0. Just plugging it in and do it in calculation. And thus, the C's are, I don't know how one should call them. People call them Dirac fermions. But I think one can give them kind of other names as well. The more conventional fermions which you're used to. OK, this is just algebra. You know, you take this, you plug it in, you use this. And you see, it works. Um, what kind of operators can I make which are quadratic in the gammas, if I just have gamma 1 and 2? Why, why, why I want to have something quadratic in gamma? Gamma is a fermionic operator. A Hamiltonian is a bosonic operator. So in the Hamiltonian, there will be only quadratic terms in terms of fermions appearing. Otherwise, you're doing something pretty wrong. So, so my question is, what kind of term can appear in the Hamiltonian if I have gamma 1 and gamma 2, given what kind of quadratic terms you might actually want to do with gamma 1 and gamma 2? You start thinking. I can do gamma 1 squared. But gamma 1 squared is actually the identity operator. So it's no operator which acts on the Majoranas. Yeah? You can do gamma 2, 2 squared, but that's also the identity operator. So there are two options left. You can do gamma 1, gamma 2, or gamma 2, gamma 1. But they're the same up to a minus sign. Because if you exchange them, you get a minus sign. So the only operator. is actually gamma 1, gamma 2. It turns out this operator is not Hermitian. As hopefully all of you are aware, a product of two Hermitian operators is not necessarily Hermitian. But if you supply an I, then it becomes Hermitian. Because if you do the dagger, i goes to minus i. If you do the dagger, it exchanges the two, which also gives a minus sign. So that's fine. And you call it actually p if you put the minus sign additionally here. Who cares? 
And P is the parity in the sense that it's, in terms of usual fermion, it's a C dagger C. And it has eigenvalue plus or minus one. So if the state is empty, it has eigenvalue plus one. There's no fermion there. If the state is filled, it has eigenvalue minus one. There's a fermion there. And the fermion parity is minus, okay? So the fermion parity in general is like minus one to the number of fermions. That's a fermion parity in general. So why I'm talking so long about fermion parity? Um, because of the following thing. Um, okay, are there questions to this? So, yeah? Why do I want to introduce the C's in the first place? Because it's about the C's, you know how the Fox space looks. Yeah, I mean, the C's are usual fermions. So what is the Fox space of two fermionic modes, for example? Yeah, so the Fox space of two fermionic modes. Is zero, zero, which you might call the vacuum. One, zero, zero, one and one, one, for example. And the dimension of the Fox space is uh, two, if this is n, let's call it small n. Yeah. Dimension two to the n, yeah? If I would have asked you what's the dimension of the Fox space of four Majorana modes, you would have had hard times to tell me because, unless you know this trick, yeah? Okay. So in terms of Majoranas, then the dimension of the Fox space is two to the n half. And here kind of it's important that the Majoranas always appear in pairs, yeah? You can pair them up. You will have in the exercise some um, exercise about odd number of Majorana fermions, and you will see some features of that. Now it's a fact of physics that there's something operational in the world which is called superselection. And super selection tells you, even though you might be able to do um, superpositions, for example, this term, yeah? This term generates a superposition between having zero fermions if it's coherently acting and two fermions. But you're never able to make a superposition between an even and an odd number of fermions in your system. different total parity states. Parity always means fermion parity in this context, yeah? And the total fermion parity is just, uh, I don't know. The product of the individual fermion parities. Okay. And this can be again plus minus one, and it's actually really two to the number of firm, uh, minus one to the number of fermions. So because the super selection, this is kind of wrong counting. In a sense, I mean, it's correct counting, but in the sense it's not useful for quantum information purposes if you cannot make superposition, yeah? 
So the, the statement is super selection is you started out with the universe with an odd number of fermions, you always stay in an universe with an odd number of fermions. Yeah? I mean, you can generate fermions in pairs like electron positron, but never alone. So, so you actually have to subtract one from this, um, or two from this. Maybe you have other constraints in your system, then you have to, cannot access even that complete Fox space, but, uh, but that's the minimum which you have to do. Okay. So we want now to encode a, a qubit in this Fox space. And uh, so what is the n which we need in order to encode a qubit? That's, I think that's a simple question. Let me erase the blackboard. I think all of you might solve this equation. So the correct answer is n equal 4. I hope you managed to solve this equation. So if you put n equal 4, 4 divided by 2 is 2 minus 1 is 1. 2 to the 1 is 2. That's a qubit Hilbert space. Good. So if you have four Majorana fermions, we have uh, gamma 1, Gamma two, gamma three, and gamma four. We keep them far away from each other. Yeah, so they really might run affirmance. <coughs> so now we choose a gauge. Okay? So gauge is just a fancy word of kind of pairing them up artificially. We say kind of we consider these to be a complex fermion and these to be a complex fermion. And then the parity can be plus or minus one or the number of fermions can be zero or one in each of these. Yeah? Because each of these two together form a fermionic mode which can be either empty or occupied. <coughs> okay? Now you have, we have to be in a super selection sector. And it actually doesn't matter in which one we are. So we say we are like total parity is plus one. So out of these four states, when we do kind of the product of these two, which states are in the parity plus one super selection sector? Yeah? So you're zero and one one. Yeah? I hope that's clear to everybody. So we call this, and that's the encoding, the wiggle, or two qubit states, yeah? Okay. So if you're in the state zero, zero, we call it, we're in the state zero. If we're in one, one, we're in state one. So what is the, let's say, C operation? I do a wiggle on top. <coughs> so th what, what is the one which tells me if I'm in the zero or in the one state? In terms of Majorana fermions, of course. So which operator of the Majorana fermions tells me if I'm in this or in this state? What, what do I have to measure? Yeah? Any? So if I measure the, the, the fermion parity of the first one, it tells me in which state I am. And the fermion parity was minus one, gamma one, gamma two. Okay. 
but I could have equivalently measured the fermion parity of the second two. And the reason why these two are equivalent is because they're in the super selection sector. So we have a constraint on the product of all four run operators. Okay, sigma c. That means we have a classical bit. Good. So much work. Uh, <laughs> so better we find the sigma x to it. No? Something which uh, actually generates some superposition of the two. So what is an operator which anti-commutes with the C operator? So you see this C operator, maybe I put colors, that's. Uh, actually lots of this stuff you know already from Tori code and stuff like that. It's actually very similar. Uh, in many respects. Okay. So the X operator, an operator which anti-commutes. I mean, we have fermions. It's not so hard to find something which anti-commutes. No? Yeah? These two? No, no. I mean, if I write, for example, down an operator, for example, gamma 2 anti-commutes with this, no? Or almost, yeah? Because it anti-commutes with the gamma 1. Yeah. But then it should additionally also anti-commute with this one here. I mean, we anyway have to have a bosonic operator. This really, I mean, Actually, only this anti-commute with both of them. But you see that actually, because it actually shares one fermion here. You know in this Tori code, if you share a qubit and so Now we share a fermion. OK, so this anti-commutes with the, the one on top. And of course, equivalently, we could have these two. And you can check that they anti-commute with each other. And sigma y, the y operation is then the product, which is the product of these two. And now observation, all these logical operations are non-local. I can bring this extremely far away from each other. And in order to apply a sigma c or sigma x, I have to do something here and here. And my stupid environment will not do that because it kind of acts locally. That's at least the assumption. OK, so we have topological protection. Or one would think one has topological protection. Because what we have to forbid is that we actually change the super selection sector. And I said, yeah, yeah, you know, super selection is anyway physical, so. But the fact that I can bring an electron from somewhere else and put it in here changes, of course, the Fermi parity of this system. Okay. So uh, I have to stay. We have to stay. in super selection uh, sector. No odd number of fermions from outside. Important. But if you can guarantee me that this system doesn't get fermions from the outside, Then in order to apply a logical operation, I have to do something non-local. Is this clear? 
And at least from a theoretician, it kind of doesn't look so complicated to keep a system isolated that not the fermion comes from somewhere and sits in there. But of course, in practice, it's a bit more complicated. Of course, yeah. That's the next part of the lecture, which we don't do today. But the difficulty of manipulation, did you see this? There comes this idea of braiding the stuff. So you see, first you protect it topologically. That's very nice. So now we have a, a quantum memory, which is good. And actually topological protection, we call it always parity protection. Because we rely on, 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 the, on the protection of the fermion parity. But then exactly that's your statement. It's very easy for me to make a qubit which is protected. You know. I take a hydrogen atom or something else. I, I, I know. I, I take the spin of the, the, of the electron in the lowest level and I send it to outer space as far away as possible. Yeah. And most likely it will stay there very long in, the, in whatever superposition I prepared it. But then the problem is about the operation. Yeah? There's always this trade-off. Operation, either I'm you know, very easy to operate or I protect it very nicely. But the idea of topological quantum computation is actually you can bring both together. It turns out the operation is also protected and all what you have to do is kind of moving these particles around each other. The, the moving around, we, we look tomorrow a bit. But uh, you, you see, there's not so much physics in this uh, lecture because, um, so the, the time is short and I wanted just to give you kind of at least the idea of what topological quantum computation is about. Um, if you're interested kind of how to <laughs> physically implement the stuff, then maybe we have to discuss uh, in private uh, at some later stage. Okay, are there any other questions? Otherwise, I think the time is up and uh, we'll continue tomorrow.